on the next Great Lakes Now. An invisible giant lurking in the forest undetected for centuries. The large individual was probably several thousand years old. How old time gangsters got away from it all. There's always a great relationship between the townsfolk and the mafia. And news from across the Great Lakes region. Well, hello and welcome to the Great Lakes Now Facebook and YouTube Live episode sneak peek watch party about mushrooms of the Great Lakes. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm Anna Seisling, producer of Great Lakes Now. I also want to welcome our other watch party co-hosts. And as I read off all of them, Tammy, let's show off this cool map graphic that we have. All right. So our event co-hosts for tonight, Detroit Public Television, WNMU-TV, PBS in Marquette, Michigan, PBS Western Reserve in Kent, Ohio. WPBS TV in Watertown, New York, WQLN in Erie, Pennsylvania, Tara at Detroit Public Television, Michigan Learning Channel, and we are also streaming or cross posting on Milwaukee PBS, our Great Lakes, and our Great Lakes Now YouTube channel. And I want to just circle back on uh, one of those um, one of those partners that I mentioned just a moment ago, and that is WNMU TV in Marquette, who, as I just said, they are co hosting tonight. And you know what? They are the PBS station in Marquette, Michigan, where they air the full documentary about this humongous fungus. It first aired earlier this year. So if you are a WNMU viewer, you can see the full documentary, The Humongous Fungus Among Us, on that channel again on May 1st. So be sure to check those local listings for the time. Also, we do have a little challenge going on at Great Lakes now, and that is to reach 10,000 followers on Facebook. So if you are watching on Facebook tonight, please make sure that you've clicked on follow on the Great Lakes Now Facebook page. We are not selling your information, nothing like that, but we do post a lot about our work and our events and of course, news and lakes that you love on Facebook. So you will be making sure by clicking that follow button that you are not missing out on anything. All right, so we've got a really great lineup of guests joining us a little bit later in the watch party who are going to answer your questions about all things mushroom and edible foraging in the Great Lakes, all of that good stuff. Um, so please, as always, plan to kind of get engaged, interact with me. Let me know if you have questions or if you just want to check in and say, hey, I'm watching from blank. I'd love to, uh, you know, I'd love to bring you into the conversation in that way, too. So all of that being said, let's take a peek at the Great Lakes Now Humongous Fungus segment from the latest episode of Great Lakes Now called Mushrooms and Mobsters. If you're like me, you haven't spent a lot of time celebrating fungus, but in one town in our region, there's a fungus with a following. Mushrooms can appear as if by magic. But what you see popping up on your lawn is just the fruiting body. This fruit doesn't come from a tree. Instead, it comes from an underground network of fungus called mycelium. And these fungal networks can be huge. This is Crystal Falls, a friendly, quaint community in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. In 1992, the residents of Crystal Falls found out they had a remarkable, gigantic, and nearly invisible neighbor after scientist and forest pathologist Johann Brun discovered one of the largest fungal networks on the planet. Here's an example of a very poisonous mushroom. We estimated that the large individual occupied about 38 acres of the forest floor. I think we called it something like 100 tons and was probably several thousand years old. Johan is a key figure in a documentary about the discovery, aptly titled The Humongous Fungus Among Us. It was created by filmmaker and Crystal Falls native Tim Warmanen, who works in video post-production in Chicago. I used to tell people that I'd work with in post-production that, you know, I grew up in this small town next to this really giant mushroom. And people said, like, what, what are you talking about? And I always, like, questioned, like, what am I talking about? I feel like people in the community maybe didn't know a ton about it. And so, you know, I thought maybe we could interview the original scientists who discovered this thing, like, best to go to the source. 
Tim began working on the project in 2013, and in 2021, it premiered at the Crystal Theater in downtown Crystal Falls. There's something lurking in the woods. Literally hundreds of newspapers, magazines, even the television networks are covering the humongous fungus and it's conjuring up all sorts of images. When the fungus was discovered and when the documentary was shot, Jeff Serginen co-owned the Crystal Falls Ben Franklin Variety Store. And at the time, everyone was thinking it was an April Fool's joke because uh, it just sounded so bizarre to most people here. Bizarre or not, when Jeff heard fungus, he saw an opportunity. The Fungus Fest starts today. He helped to organize a number of community events and parties, all centered on the humongous fungus discovery. Jeff and his wife even came up with humongous fungus t-shirts. Played with our words a little bit and changed the spelling of humongous a little bit to go along with the fungus. This is the current one. It's become Definitely a part of Crystal Falls history. <laughs> <laughs> if I had to guess, in the past 30 years uh, at the Ben Franklin store, we sold roughly 20,000 humongous fungus t-shirts. The community fell in love with the humongous fungus and in 1992 began celebrating it with an annual Crystal Falls Fungus Festival. Since then, the fungus and the festival have become part of the town's identity. The mushroom also made a splash in the media and in the scientific community. It was one of these bizarre items that was in the paper today. You may have read about this. The scientists have found the world's largest living organism in Michigan. Did you read it? It's a 100-ton mushroom. True, a fungus spread over 30 acres. And the most amazing thing that they didn't tell you it's sitting on top of a 500-acre porterhouse steak. <laughs> Myron Smith was a graduate student when the fungus was discovered and studied it with Johann Brun and scientist Jim Anderson. Jim worked on the genetics of our malaria. Jim had just taken on a new graduate student, Myron Smith. We were a, a tremendously compatible team of researchers as well as friends. When that paper in 92 came out, there was a lot of press interest and there was a lot of appreciation for the um, sort of the, the publicity uh, that was gained about fungi in general, because fungi are super interesting and very important and rather mysterious. If the environment stresses living trees, our malaria is going to take advantage of that stress and kill them. In the natural ecosystem, they're really fulfilling a need. And the other role that uh, this fungus has in the forest ecosystem is that it's really important for recycling nutrients. There are a lot of lessons to be learned from how these organisms have lived for thousands of years in the same spot. Obviously, they're managing their resources efficiently and sustainably. Is there a chance that the humongous fungus will outlive us all? Well, it's, oh, it's, it's almost it's a certainty. certainty. It's uh, guaranteed. Yeah, almost. Yeah. Maybe not guaranteed. I'm, I'm, oh, I think so. Pretty close. I think it's a guarantee. Pretty close. Yeah. It's guaranteed, I think. Yeah. Okay. Over the years, Johan, Myron, and Jim learned that the fungus was much larger and much older than they originally thought. You've been studying this individual for, for decades now. Give us an idea how large and how old. Now we know that it's at least 2,500 years old. It weighs about 440 tons. And it occupies an area of almost 200 acres. Wow, <laughs> that's big. They also discovered the fungus's genes are remarkably stable. An organism so large and old might be prone to a lot of mutation, but Myron says that's not the case. We're not sure how it maintains that stability, but you know, it's a real lesson somehow in how to protect and maintain your genome and we can contrast that you know for example to 
uh, cancer in humans where the genome very quickly takes on new mutations. This organism has fewer mutations from one end to the other than we do as humans uh, from our fingertip to our toes. Tim says the mushroom and his film about it are a testament to what sets his hometown apart. But we won't know for a couple of months. And I think it's just really, it's, it's something that we can celebrate being about, you know, the wonders of nature in a small community. And I think most importantly, it was one way, like one line in the film talks about discoverability and it, what's, what makes your community unique. And it's something that the science has drawn people in to the community and drawn people together to talk about the wonders of nature. In many ways, as the mycelium is the connective tissue of this Great Lakes ecosystem, it's also become a source of unity for the town of Crystal Falls. The local people just get a nice smile when you even bring up the word humongous fungus. It, it's just been a, a real uh, happy thing for our community and, and it just kind of puts us on the map in a different way, a way that is exciting and, and fun for, for people. But in case you're planning your trip to Crystal Falls to find the mega mushroom. And I've been asked this many times because I seem to be the person that answers most of the questions up here. We always tell them that it's something you can't see. It's something that you really don't need to go to. And then, of course, then they ask me, is it, is it, is it real? Or are you just, did you guys just make all this up to get a little publicity? And it's like, no, but we, we really want to protect the forest and, and the area where the mushroom is. So we, we do discourage people from going into that area. But don't worry, there are lots of mushroom related activities on offer in Crystal Falls. So if you need a fungal fix, consider checking out the town's annual Humongous Fungus Festival. It's open to the public and takes place every summer. At Great Lakes Now, we aim to cover the Great Lakes region and the people who live here, like you. Please follow us on social media, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and sign up for our newsletter at greatlakesnow.org. All right, there was a lot there, right? So before we start unpacking everything that we saw, I do want to make sure that we drop a link to the landing page for the April episode into the chat. In that landing page, you will find lots of cool extras, links, a map, everything related to that segment and the other ones that are part of the April episode of Great Lakes Now. And before we welcome our guests, I'm super excited to see we have some names trickling in, uh, people who are tuning in. So let's get to some of those. We have Darlene, who is watching from Detroit. We have Jamie, who's near Duluth. We have Danielle in Fox Valley, Wisconsin. We have Pete Warmanin, who I think might be related to one of our guests tonight, grew up in Crystal Falls, tuning in now from Chicagoland. We have Ruth from Las Vegas, Nevada. We have Elizabeth in Dousman, Wisconsin, Tiffany in Gladstone, Michigan, and we have Susan from Long Island, Sarah from Ohio. Uh, all right, so if you are watching and you want the next name I say to be your name, give you a little shout out for tuning in tonight, feel free to drop that into the comments. And then also, you know, let us know your favorite kind of mushroom or if you have a favorite mushroom recipe maybe, um, or if you've ever foraged for wild food, that's gonna be something that we're getting into tonight. And that on that note, you know, what questions do you have about foraging? for mushrooms or other edible wild foods in the Great Lakes. Feel free to answer any or all of those questions in the chat and I will work you in as we go. All right, so now I'm really excited to welcome our guests for tonight. First up, we have Tim Warmanin, who is a Crystal Falls, Michigan native and the filmmaker behind the Humongous Fungus Among Us documentary. Tim, so good to have you with us. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And then we have Clay Bowers, who is a foraging instructor and wild food generalist based in northern Michigan. You can find out more about his work at Nomi, that's N-O-M-I forager.com. Hi, Clay. Welcome. Hello. Great. And then we have Matthew Norman Sella, Wisconsin-based foraging educator, certified mushroom identifier through the Midwest American Mycological Information Program and owner of Eden Wild Food. Matt, great to have you with us as well. Good to be here. Thank you. 
All right. So uh, Matt and Clay, we'll get to you guys in a little bit, but let's start out with Tim. Um, so Tim, we heard you talking in that segment that we just saw about your history growing up in Crystal Falls. I'm wondering though, if you can talk a little bit more about what it was like to actually start working on this documentary. Did it feel like the kid inside was finally going to get the inside scoop on this kind of giant mushroom that you grew up hearing about for so long? I think definitely. I was I was so curious for a number of years, but never actually started researching until, you know, 13 years after I left uh, Crystal Falls. But, you know, throughout the whole process of talking to people from the community and, you know, just, yeah, trying to get back to the source, really, like, let's talk to the original scientists. Could we could we get them to really explain so we can all understand what we're all celebrating every year? But yeah, it's just been a true passion project, a real pleasure all these years. And I have to say, um, for folks who have not checked out the Humongous Fungus, uh, Fungus Among Us uh, full documentary, I would urge you to do that. Um, and we can make sure that we drop a link to the Humongous Fungus documentary Facebook page in the chat for people who want to learn more and find ways to watch that film. Um, I think your passion, Tim, was so apparent all throughout that documentary. I'm wondering what the coolest part of working on it was for you. It had to have kind of felt like some sort of full circle moment, right? Yeah, I think the coolest part uh, would be, you know, we went into this, uh, Logan, Lori, and I went into this whole project thinking, oh, it's just going to be a historical piece, which is great because we wanted to know what happened um, at that time. It was 25 years ago, the discovery back in 1992. But after we did our first interview over a weekend with Johan that he invited to his home in Missouri, he said, well, all right, do you want to come up to the UP? Because Jim and Myron are going to be up there and we're still researching it. So I think the most incredible part was that they were continuing to learn from this all these years later. And we were just the serendipity of getting the opportunity to go out in the woods with them. And the original scientists, all three of them showing what they discovered was just incredible. Oh, that is so cool. Um, I also have to give a shout out to who I think is another relative of yours, Hannah, who says they are also there in Chicagoland. So there we that's go. Right. That's right. Hannah's my wife. Yep. Oh, perfect. <laughs> and then Ruth is saying, go Tim. Love that. So you've definitely got some fans out there tonight. <laughs> that's right. Um, that's great. So, so, you know, as you initially said, and I think we kind of were able to sort of pick and choose certain clips um, in the Great Lakes Now segment that, of course, used so much of your documentary footage. Um, it was kind of equal parts like community and then also a lot of the science, too. I'm wondering what the most surprising thing was, as you know, I'm assuming you are someone who does not also have a, a, a mycology background. A, you're a filmmaker. So what was the most surprising thing that you learned while shooting this documentary? You know, uh, I think it would be when Johan told us that underground it glows in the dark mm. i think that was a very interesting fact that i had no idea that was the case and he told us a story that um he was with jim and myron and they threw some you know test pieces in a garbage can and then when they come when they came back later they saw that they were all kind of glowing in the garbage can which is <laughs> super fun so um that's one of many i mean like you said i went into the process knowing very little and I and I I definitely feel like I understand a lot more, uh, not to the level that, you know, Jim and Johan and Myron know, but um, far more than I ever expected I would I would understand, I think. So I'm excited about that. Absolutely. And um, Tammy, I want to start showing some photos here of Tim kind of behind the scenes producing this film. And um, as we check those out, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit, Tim, about what you think the other filmmakers, um, Lori and Logan, what do you think they made of this whole experience, kind of going up to your hometown, this little place in the UP and finding out about this crazy giant mushroom? <laughs> right. How fun was that? We all packed into the same car, headed up there. We stayed, were fortunate enough to stay at my mom's house because she still lives in Crystal Falls. Um, I know that they were both just as passionate as I was about finding out about this story because they thought it was so quirky and interesting. And they were really into the science as well. So you see, you've got Logan there. He shot and uh, directed the documentary. I was the writer, producer and editor of the film. And then Lori is the executive producer. So, yeah, just going out into the woods, putting on bug spray together and shooting for, you know, it, 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 we had about, I think, about 10 full shoot days that we did over different locations. But um, they're good friends of mine, too. So it was kind of 
a process of let's go do something that we're, you know, just excited about doing. Uh, like I say again, a passion project. Yeah, cool. So um, Virginia in Kent, Ohio says that she found her first morels of the season here today. I love to hear that. Congratulations, Virginia. Always an exciting discovery when that moment of spring comes. And then Darlene has a question. And Tim, I know we've been saying you're you know, not a mushroom expert, um, and maybe this would be better for uh, the other guests, but I'll just, I'll give it to you and see if you can take a crack at it. So do you happen to know if there are any other large fungi organisms in the Great Lakes area? Area. Um, I mean, n- none as big as that one, right? Right. I mean, none that they've discovered. Like, it's a it's a common fungus. Like throughout um, the type of wooded area that it's in, it's like there there's fungus all over the world, and it's you know it's playing a role. It's a it's a symbiotic relationship in its environment and lives in one place. You know the the scientist told me like this one in particular is known to be just a very successful individual. Mm -hmm. And I'll just explain that. I mean, it started from two 10 microns of a meter, two spores connected and eight inches a year basically grew out. And that's how they can kind of understand or guesstimate, right? How old it could be. It could be at 2,500 years old. It could be up to 10,000 years old, but so Without these kind of organisms, the forest would build up decaying wood like on top of it. So it's it's a really important recycler of nutrients. Mm-hmm. Um, Israel uh, says that they are from Appleton and he foraged for the first time last year. And then we have Dan who is tuning in from uh, Conway, South Carolina. So I'm wondering, um, Tim, and we'll have to wrap things up here pretty soon, but um, how did you come up with the name for the documentary? And um, Tammy, let's check out this B-roll of the, of when it actually premiered. Talk a little bit about the name and then kind of, you know, what it felt like to be premiering this, um, this documentary back in your hometown in Crystal falls sure thing our actually our working title was hf Hmm. we just called it hf because johan always referenced to it as hf the hf and from there we thought maybe the fungus among us and then just there's just something wasn't quite right i just had to get in the full title i had to get in the humongous fungus (laughs) right so it all just that felt like oh you know it's all encompassing um but then playing uh uh, premiering it in Crystal Falls was that is basically the dream that I had working the eight years basically that it took for you know working with all the people that were interested in doing it and I mean I gotta give a shout out to Katrina Zimmerman as well who was a person who did animations for us and she was just excited about the idea too so it was just I, I want to do them. And, and it was so crucial because when Logan and I started this project, it's like, well, how do we capture our main character when you can't see it? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> so right. We needed to have, we needed yeah, animations the, to explain. The animation really is just incredible and was so helpful. I think exactly like you're saying for those Agreed. kind of explanatory under the ground um, kind of moments in the film. All right. So last thing is um, there is this fungus fest. It's been going on for a long time. It's happening again this year, um, August 12th to 14th in Crystal Falls. We will drop a link in the chat for people who are interested, want to make the trek up to uh, the UP of Michigan to check that out. Um, Tim, are you planning on going to the fungus fest this year? I will be there. I will be there. And the film will play on August, uh, the Saturday of that weekend. It's going to play uh, twice during that day. So yeah, feel free to come out to the historic crystal theater. It's a beautiful location and a brand new screen. Um, and, uh, it'll be a lot of fun. Hopefully, hopefully we can get a lot more visitors this year and, you know, make it a much bigger event too. Love that. All right, Tim, stick around for just a few minutes. I'm going to bring in Clay and uh, Matthew next. Um, So, and as a reminder to all of you tuned in, so um, where are you watching from? What is your favorite kind of mushroom? Maybe you have a favorite mushroom recipe that you want to share, or if you've ever foraged for wild food, which is what we're going to talk about here for a few minutes. And, you know, if you have any questions about foraging for mushrooms or wild food in the Great Lakes region, feel free to drop those in because we have a couple of pros that we are going to close things out with here. So, all right, now I'm really excited to welcome Clay Bowers and Matthew Normansell, our Great Lakes foragers. Hi, Clay. Clay and Matt, how's it going? Pretty good. Good, thanks. 
All right. Um, Tammy, I think that we can hide Tim for now. We'll bring him back later if anybody has questions about the documentary. Thank you. Um, all right. So I think it makes the most sense for the three of us to just kind of chat. But um, Clay, I do want to start with you first. So talk a little bit about what your background is, how long you've been foraging, and how you first got into it. I got into foraging as a direct result of wanting to live more sustainably off of the land and getting kind of into survivalism. That was about 16 or 17 years ago. And I thought to myself, I can't really eat out of buckets if anything ever goes bad. So I need to learn how to eat from the land. And that's where I got interested with it. And now it's been uh, something I'm obsessed with ever since. I've been hunting, fishing, foraging, and doing everything possible that I can for 16 years. And I try to take trips around the country and harvest from different places as well. Oh, that is so cool. And I know that there's such a robust, um, especially in the last few years, I feel like a really robust and kind of growing interest around foraging, around wild harvesting. So for all of those uh, people out there who, like me, are just kind of fascinated by this, feel free to drop those questions in for Clay and Matt here. All right. So, Matt, now I'm curious, uh, talk a little bit about your story and where, where you're from. Yeah, I grew up in the UK. I've been living there till about 2017. Uh, I've been coming to Wisconsin back and forth since 2015. Uh, my wife is a local, um, so I relocated here back in 2017. I've been foraging for about 20 years. Uh, I think I first got interested. I, I grew up foraging. Like we did a little bit of, you know, picking uh, fruits and you know various kind of you know nettles and sort of low scale foraging as I would call it but I never really kind of took it any further and I got to about 16 17 and just kind of got a bit obsessed with it and wanted to know what everything around me was and it just kind of spiraled from there over the next five or six years to a point where I felt confident that I knew enough to start teaching other people and then that was my journey then developing those teaching skills to be able to share my passion with other people so sure um, so, all right, we do have some questions coming in. We have one from Tiffany, um, who wants to know any tips on finding morels? Um, whoever wants to answer that first, feel free to just jump in. Mm, I think Matt's got this. All right, Matt, what do you got? I, I to come up with a sort of slightly lame answer. And just the, the answer I always say is walk, like put the hours in, put the time in. I think people expect to, to have some magic bullet, but I think with morels, they, they aren't anywhere near as common as some of the other fungi. Um, they're kind of harder to pin down when it comes to like some, some fungi and mycorrhizal. So you can find the right tree associations and learn to kind of look at the topography and, and tune in. But with morels, yeah, they do like uh, the decaying elm trees and sometimes dying ash trees. So people look around them, especially ones that have recently died and the bark is just starting to separate. Um, there's a species of morel, uh, Mochella diminutiva, which is like uh, tulip poplar. Um, so if you're familiar with tulip poplar and you have that in your area, it's good to go around there. But realistically, just cover a lot of distance. Walk, walk, look, walk, uh, and eventually you'll hit, you'll hit a patch of them. Um, but it is, uh, you know, a mileage game, I think. Got it. Okay. Um, and I'm wondering, Matt, can you turn your speakers down just a smidge for us? We're getting a little bit of feedback there. Um, so, all right, we have another uh, question coming in. So this is from Elizabeth. In the Southern Kettle Moraine area, what should I be looking for in the woods? Um, I'm not actually familiar with where uh, Southern Kettle Moraine is. Um, are either of you? Yes, that's in Wisconsin. Okay. Uh, it's about uh, maybe an hour south of where I am in, in Appleton. So what was the question? What what should I be looking for in the woods is what Elizabeth wants to know. And I'm assuming uh, she means this time of year. Yeah, I mean, you will find morels in the Cal Moraine this time of year. Um, you may find, find some ramps, especially around the, the edges. Um, there's lots of, uh, you know, edible spring ephemeral plants. Um, the thing I say for beginners to look, look for primarily is... Um, Pheasant bite mushroom, or sometimes known as dryad settle, square Cereoporus squamosus. Um, it's a really easy to identify mushroom. The top of it looks like the back of a female pheasant, um, mm -hmm. a kind of patination. Uh, it's safe to eat if it's young and tender. Um, you know, it's it's good a good edible. Some people like it, some people don't. But it's uh, it's an easy one to identify, and it's really really prolific at this time of year. You know, for every one morel you might find, you probably could find a hundred of those. So mm -hmm. um, I always say, like, if you go looking for morels. You're going to find those. That's kind of almost like a, a consolation prize. So, 
Got it. All right. And then uh, Kay says, our woods were full of morels when we lived in Southeast North Carolina. Good to know. Um, and then Barbara uh, says that her favorite mushroom is a portabella. All right. Well, there we go. So um, Clay, I want to bring you back into the fold a little bit here. I know that you had said when you and I talked a couple of weeks ago that you focus a little bit more on plants and you're in Northern Michigan. So right now at this point, uh, at the end of April, talk a little bit about what kinds of things you are for for right now? Well, not a lot right now, thanks to our awesome cold spell. Actually, right outside my window, it is snowing right now. Mm. Um, so uh, on a typical year, though, what I'd be aiming for this time of year would be cattail shoots, stinging nettle, uh, wild parsnips. We dig a lot of wild parsnips every year. Um, just basically all the spring ephemerals. You know, we do the, um, the same things that that Matt just mentioned, all the plants, the ramps, and um, we like to do focus heavily on invasive species, though. That's why I said uh, parsnips. Got it. All right. So, um, Matt, just for the sake of, you know, we're, we're technically over already, so I don't want to keep everybody too much later, but um, Matt sent over so many incredible mushroom photos. So I'd love if we can maybe just kind of start showing some of those. And um, Matt, you can kind of talk through what we're seeing here. So tell, tell us a little bit about this mushroom. Yeah, that's a young chicken of the woods. Uh, there's actually two different species of chicken of the woods. This is Latopurus sulfurus. And it's uh, a bracket fungus that tends to grow on the side of uh, dead or, or decaying or slightly damaged oak trees, uh, primarily. Um, and there's another species with white paws, which tends to grow off the base of the oak tree. Uh, good edible. It needs to be well cooked. Okay. Now, this one is uh, Lactarius indigo. The indigo milk cap tends to associate with uh, primarily white pine. I get this up in sort of to where, it's where clay, uh, clay lives up in Michigan. Uh, this tends to grow further north. I don't tend to get them by me. Okay. Um, all right. And then I, I just want to pop in here just for a second, because we are getting some um, audience engagement. And of course, I want to include people in on this watch party. So um, Danielle says, Dryad Saddle can smell a little like cucumber, um, which I've never actually heard before. Um, Clay, Matt, either of you, is that something that kind of resonates based on your experience? Yeah, I'd say watermelon rind or, or cucumber. Yeah uh pretty strongly yeah, it's it's a really good indicator people don't uh, often realize that smell is really important for mushroom identification so you know you'll read in the books it'll actually say you know smells like or you know has an aroma of mm. and it can be pretty important and that's a that's a really distinctive one Okay. And um, as Clay was saying just a minute ago, we are having a little bit cooler spring than normal. So are there any Midwest fungi that you can forage for in cooler springs like we're having this year? Um, yeah, I mean, the, earl the earliest one you'll see probably around here is um, the Scarlet Elf Cup. Um, it's a, a little cup-shaped fungus, um, bright red on the inside. Uh, it's similar, it sporulates in a similar way to uh, morels, and, and that occurs very early in the season and I haven't been out yet too much. So I haven't found any yet, but it should be around now. I've seen people posting them online um, and that will follow through into the early morale season. So that's probably the earliest one you'll find right now. Okay, cool. And we have a shout out to David Klauser, who says hi from Northeast Ohio, watching on PBS Western Reserve. And um, Elizabeth says that um, I'm going to try eating my gout weed. All right. So Clay, are you familiar with gout weed? If she's talking about um, what I would call uh, bishop's weed, also known sometimes as gout weed, that would be um, Agapodium podagraria. Yeah, that... Uh, it's delicious. It's absolutely wonderful, but it's a member of the Apiaceae and you got to make sure you have the right species because some of them are actually deadly. Yep. Yeah. And that's a, that's actually a really important point that I think that we should talk a little bit about. So talk, um, Clay, let's, we'll have you start on this one. What are some uh, kind of best practices around making sure that you are identifying mushrooms properly? Because of course there are mushroom varieties, some are edible, but others are toxic. And obviously we want to avoid that. As I mentioned to you previously, my favorite thing to do is, is plants, but um, with mushrooms, I've been eating wild mushrooms for 10 or 11 years now and uh, not nearly as long as Matt. Um, but in my, in my experience, the best thing to do is that if you don't know the full identity of a mushroom, then you just don't eat it until you can get a proper identification of that mushroom. 
Okay, that yeah. that makes sense. Matt, do you have anything that you'd like to add to that in terms of just you know helping uh, novice foragers identify mushrooms? Yeah, I think people tend to get overly scared, but there are only really five or six species of mushroom in Wisconsin that are really close to being deadly toxic or deadly toxic. Um, but yeah, if in doubt, throw it out. And I always say like you want to be as confident as you would be going into a supermarket and reaching for a, a carrot or a cauliflower or something off the shelf with that mushroom before you want to eat it. You know, don't if there's any doubt, you know, don't don't mess with it. The difference between though with plants and mushrooms is that it is actually safe to taste and spit mm -hmm. any mushroom. They, there, there are no mushroom that will you know cause irritation or poisoning in your mouth. You know, it has to, you have to ingest it. Whereas with plants, there, there are plants that can injure you just from tasting them. So that's mm -hmm. a, a primary difference there. Sure. And I want to make sure that we get both Clay and Matt's websites in the chat. Uh, so Clay's uh, website is Nomi Forager. That's N-O-M-I Forager. And then Matthew's website for Eden Wild Foods. We'll, make, we'll be sure to get both of those in the chat. Um, so just to kind of round things out for the sake of time, I feel like I could talk to you both for a, another hour at least. But, um, you know, obviously cooking these things, you know, foraging edible foods. So I'm wondering, Matt, let's start with you. And you sent us a a pretty delicious looking photo um what are some of your favorite things to cook with the mushrooms that you uh, that you forage um i yeah this this is a chicken dish we did it's uh, kind of inspired like um my wife has uh like her lineage comes from uh ukraine and poland and that that kind of area they do a lot of uh like mushrooms and like a sour cream sauce and that mm -hmm. sort of thing so that's a that's an easy go-to and you can do that you know with chicken you can just do it on a piece of toast uh, it's just a nice simple way to um any, any fat that you cook the mushroom in is going to extract the flavor out so when you make a sauce with cream or sour cream it, it does a really good job of extracting all those uh, those flavors into the fats uh, and you really get the essence of the mushroom so it's one of my you know kind of easy go-to uh, things to do awesome um are there any other recipes that you love or maybe just like best practices around preparation. I know that like, like you were saying, just any kind of fat to kind of infuse that. Yeah, my, my pet peeve is, is people soaking mushrooms in salt water. You'll see that a lot in the groups. Uh, and all that does is extract out a lot of the flavor and just make them go soggy. So if you want to clean mushrooms, you know, take a little bit of the stem off, use a little brush or a piece of like damp kitchen towel to clean them off. Uh, and then cook them from there, just get them kind of as clean as you can. The heat will kill any residual bacteria anyway. Um, but you know, the same thing as you would kind of with a supermarket mushroom, you really shouldn't be be, be washing those because it, it just destroys the flavor. Mm -hmm. I actually like to make pierogies and, and things like that. I like, you know, I like a lot of those kind of Russian, mm -hmm. Polish, Eastern European inspired stuff because they're very big mycophilic culture. So they really know what they're doing with, with mushrooms. So. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right. And Clay, what about you? What are your some, some of your favorite things to make with the uh, wild foods that you forage and harvest? Um, since we're going with mushrooms, I'll just answer with mushrooms. Um, I don't make them personally, but my girlfriend Madeline does. Every year we get chanterelles and she'll actually grind them up and then uh, turn them into, mix them with the hummus. Or not, sorry, I'm, I'm totally mistaken. Chickpeas, not hummus. She mixes them with chickpeas and then she makes these little... Um, they're basically like falafel, but with, with uh, cooked chickpeas and then cooked chanterelle mushrooms. And we make a little dipping sauce and they're really delicious. Wow. All right. I'm getting hungry hearing about that. Um, so both of you have been doing this for a long time. Matt, what is your favorite thing about this? I think uh, it, I think a lot of people can resonate with this. It's kind of what psychologists call um, intermittent reinforcement. It's kind of the never knowing quite what you're going to find. So when you go out in the woods, you, you learn to tune in and you do have an expectation of what you might find, but you never quite know exactly what you're going to find when. And it's that kind of treasure hunting kind of innate, uh, I think, thing that's in, in all of us that, you know, people who like fishing, same sort of thing. People who like bargain hunting, it's the same drive to find the unknown, find that, that hidden treasure kind of thing. And I enjoy eating it as well. So. Absolutely. And based on my own experience, I would say that there is something to be said for your eyes kind of becoming attuned. It's like that you have that rush of, you know, finding something for the first time. And then it's almost like your eyes know what to look for a little bit better. Yeah, definitely. It's it's a, well, again, a psychologist called a schema. You, you develop a, a kind of almost like a program in your brain pattern recognition. So once you learn that pattern, you know, same with anything, you will spot that anywhere. You know, you, you may have never seen that thing before. Once you pick it a few times, you'll start to notice it everywhere. It's that mm -hmm. phenomenon. People go, well, I, I saw this 
I was on, on vacation. I saw it an hour away and then I found it half an hour away and then I found it in my backyard because you learn that pattern recognition. You start to spot it kind of everywhere. So sure you can't um, and, you know. yeah danielle says oh man i need that chanterelle recipe yum so all right it sounds like i'm not the only one drooling over here clay so uh same same question to you though what do you what do you love about wild harvesting um and for you've been doing it for years now clay what do you love about it i just love being part of my land not not somebody that just i i came up with a term a couple years ago that's uh, a locally grown foreigner and a locally grown foreigner is somebody that lives inside of their house and they never experience the land around them. And so I like to actually be engaged and know what's happening and know the animals, the signs, the tracks, everything that I can find. Um, I love even experiencing the weather, whether it be extreme cold or extreme heat. I love all of it. And um, it makes me feel a lot happier than the days that I just am stuck inside. I hear that. Um, so any advice for people who are interested or just starting out in the world of Great Lakes foraging? Clay, we'll start with you. I would say that you find a good book um, first, a good couple books. And then second, if you have the uh, availability and you can pay for it, go to a teacher like myself or Matt and find um, out all the tips that we can give you in real life. And you know, I do classes all the time that are three hours in length, followed by a big snack bar that of all the wild foods that we put out. And people usually come away thinking like, oh, my God, I'm really going to get into this. And I'm sure Matt has done the same exact thing in his area. So going to a teacher that's been doing it for a long time is going to really advance your knowledge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Kind of um, embedding yourself within the already existing community of foragers. Um, yeah. Do you do you have any advice um, in addition to that, Matt? Yeah, I mean, uh, so you've, we're talking about books. I've got a, I've got a couple of books here. So great. Russian book and there's a plant book by Sam Thayer. Uh, you know, it's great to have guides. When I started out, I was almost entirely self-taught, and but you that gets you like ninety percent of the way there. But like as Clay was saying, there's, there's literally nothing. Uh, better than just taking you that extra 10% of surety of someone saying, yes, I know what this is. I've eaten it. I've done it a lot. You know, this is this is that exact thing in that book that you want. Uh, but also online resources. So I, I've got the, I run a group, Wild Food Wisconsin, um, and the ability to post like ID requests, but also see what everyone else is foraging kind of builds in that kind of almost like a digital foraging calendar. So you kind of go, oh, that, that's up in my county already. I'll go out and check my spot now. And it, you know, the digital resources that weren't there when I started foraging really, you know, it makes it a lot easier to kind of get into these days. So, yeah. Cool. All right. Carrie says, thanks for this. And I would like to echo Carrie's sentiments. I really appreciate both of you joining tonight. And, you know, it is about that time to wrap up another edition. We're actually a little over time uh, wrapping up this edition of the Great Lakes Now episode, Sneak Peek Watch Party. And even though you already got to see the mushroom segment tonight. There are two other really great stories in the April episode. One of them is about gangsters up north and the other one is the catch, which is our new regular feature with bite-sized news briefs about the lakes you love. I really hope that you'll check it out on your local PBS station or on YouTube. And as always, we'll put that link uh, for the full episode embedded on our landing page in the chat for you. All right. So I'm already really excited for next month. You'll have to tune in when we talk about the true cost of water, this really wonderful collaborative project that we've been working on with Circle of Blue, Michigan Radio, Bridge, Michigan. And of course, I would like to bring all my guests back and thank them today. So first, we have Tim Wormannon, Crystal Falls, Michigan native and the filmmaker behind the Humongous Fungus Among Us documentary. Tim, thank you so much for joining tonight. So much fun. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. And then we have Clay Bowers, foraging instructor and wild food generalist based in northern Michigan. Clay, thanks again. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Of course. And then we have Matt Norman, a Wisconsin-based foraging educator, certified mushroom identifier and owner of Eden Wild Food. Matt, thank you so much for joining. Thanks. Great to be here. And a big thank you to our co-host for this watch party. We can put that handy map graphic back up as I thank Detroit Public Television, WNMU TV, PBS, and Marquette. We have PBS Western Reserve in Kent, Ohio, WPBS TV in Watertown, New York, WQLN in Erie, Pennsylvania. We have Tara at Detroit Public Television, Michigan Learning Channel. And we are also streaming or cross-posting on Milwaukee PBS and our Great Lakes Now YouTube channel. And of course, our team, I have to thank them at Detroit Public Television, Tammy Winsell, Sandra 
Sabota, Colino, Donald, Mila Murray, Natasha Blakely, Jordan Wingrove, Rob Green, and Lana Contardi. And before we everybody wraps up, I do want to let you know that we've got some middle schoolers, or if you do have some middle schoolers in your family or social circles, and they might be interested in more about this humongous fungus, please let them or the grownups in their lives know that we've got some education lesson plans built out of this segment. So every month, our Great Lakes Now program, we also have this set of lesson plans. So they include a video from the show and accompanying learning activities, and they all match up to classroom standards for you teachers who are wondering about that. So be sure to check out all of that at greatlakesnow.org slash education. Collection four is the newest, and yes, all of it is free. And I want to thank everybody so much for watching tonight and this small request one more time if you are not following the great lakes now facebook page please pop onto our page after this watch party and click on the follow button that way we can bring you even more news about the lakes you love all right everybody i am anna sizling producer of great lakes now thank you so much for joining tonight and we will see you next time thanks